to start the panel D. Professor Fanny, do you hear me? Thank you, uh, thank right. you Navid John, Dr. Muaddam. Uh, good morning, everyone, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm pleased to all audiences and participants from Kenya, China, Canada, Iran, and other countries in the International on Canadian, Chinese, and African Sustainable Urbanization 2023. Um, and uh, in the Iranian special panel with the title, the special development and the sustainable urbanization in Iranian city planning. It's the first of our, uh, first of uh, our experience in this forum. Uh, with your support, uh, this project continues to confidently strive to build uh, sustainable urban spaces worldwide. Our discussions in this panel uh, contain various subjects. Uh, these subjects are based on, for example, um, climate resilience and sustainable uh, urbanization, urban traditional markets and neighborhood development, um, uh, spatial development and uh, rule of uh, the rule of uh, development-oriented planning in uh, addressing inequalities, uh, challenges of organizing and empowering informal settlements, and uh, finally, uh, urban good governance. Uh, some of highlights and uh, bold points in these papers are identify and uh, identify the key influential factors and potential scenarios for enhancing good governance in cities of Iran, uh, explore future research approaches that uh, encourage government private sector collaboration, addressing urban challenges that necessitates the application of the principles of good urban governance in decision making process, uh, provide an overview of uh, foresight knowledge uh, creation capabilities and the relations, focus on the relationship between sustainability and resilience in Iranian cities, Reiterating the importance of addressing climate hazards and enhancing resiliency, and finally, expressing the importance of urban planning laws to help cities become more resilient to disasters. Uh, we have uh, in this panel three sections. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first section is about uh, exploring urban sustainability and development. Section two is about challenges and uh, innovations in urban planning. And section three is uh, about uh, urban governance and informal settlements. Uh, I uh, invite the uh, Dr. Mugaddam to, to uh, run the, the first uh, presentation from Leila Ahadi and uh, Dr. Mohsen Kalantari from Shahid Beshd University, Iran. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Yes, uh, I think we don't have uh, Ms. Leila Ahadi with us right now uh, because we might need some uh, Q and A after that, uh, but anyway, I will play the the recordings right now. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. Uh, first, let me tell you uh, a little bit uh, about myself. My name is Leila Ahadi. I'm a PhD student in climatology in the University of Zanjan in Iran. As you can see on the screen, this presentation talks on the topic of analyzing of climate resilience and urban sustainability 
in this district 12 of Tehran by using AMG. The subject can be looked at under the effect of climate change, urban sustainability, and effective indicators in resilience headaches. Now let's move to the first part of the presentation. As you are aware, the effects of extreme weather conditions are unpredictable, sudden, and destructive. These threats to human settlement have made urban management and sustainability planning more challenging. Additionally, they have made cities more vulnerable. More than half of the world's population lives in cities, where these incidents significantly threaten water, food, and energy availability. In recent years, the severity and frequency of crises caused by climate change have increased. These crises included extreme weather events, rising sea levels, and ocean acidification. They have the potential to cause significant economic, environmental, and social damage. With the growing urban population worldwide, it's crucial to measure and evaluate cities' resilience. To achieve sustainable urban management, it's essential to pay attention to resilience to climate change resilience has become increasingly important in analyzing dynamic spatial systems, including cities in recent years. Resilient cities can manage climate change and disasters by establishing a stable network of physical systems and urban communities. In this way, potential problems can be reduced. Cities have physical systems such as bones, arteries, and muscles that serve as their bodies. Physical systems can resist disasters in time of disaster. Obviously, without resilient physical systems, the city will be highly vulnerable to disasters. Therefore, measuring the resilience of physical systems and providing solutions for improving their resilience is very important and necessary. Natural disasters occur in Iran every year. Most cities experience floods, storms, droughts, heat and cold waves. The accidents show Iran's vulnerability to crisis and its incapacity to cope. In recent years, Tehran has experienced floods, fine dust, air pollution, increases in temperature, and other climate disasters. Disasters have negatively impacted the city's structure and function. Tehran, Iran's capital and economic center, has unique uh, circumstances that require enhanced resilience. Now let's explain about the case study of this research. The 12th district of Tehran was selected as a case study. Tehran CBD lacks conducive environmental and physical conditions. This study aims to measure and evaluate climate resilience and sustainability variables in this area. As Tehran lies on the southern slope of the Alborz mountain, it's always at risk from natural disasters such as earthquakes, Floods and storms. The instance of this city floods after heavy rain in the estimate. In addition, fine dust and air pollution are a problem in this city. The 12th district of Tehran is located in this city's downtown. This region is 16.95 square kilometers. According to the latest census, 237,513 people live in this area. In uh, 2015. This is where Tehran's economic, political, social, and cultural centers are located. There are numerous attractions in this area, as well as its historical background and physical structure. This study examines whether this area is resilient to climate disasters. In addition, it aims to determine the variables that have the most significant impact on resilience in this area. To investigate the climatic resilience of the case study, nine criteria and 46 criteria were selected. Then urban planning and climate experts weighted the, these criteria. The AMP model was used to determine the final weight for each criteria. A significant advantage of this method over the other method is the consideration of the relationship between the variables. Finally, analysis of climate resilience in this area were conducted. Alright, let's turn to literature review. 
Many researchers have studied urban resilience in recent years due to climate change and urban instability. Also, some researchers have identified resilience indicators. No comprehensive research has been conducted that presents all criteria for evaluating urban resilience. The studies have also been conducted on how to make residential land use compatible with climate change. No study has used AMP to measure climatic resilience in Tehran's 12 districts. According to the research, this area is densely populated with low quality facilities. Furthermore, it is a less prosperous area with a low level of climate. In this study, we use the AMP method, which is a generalization of AHP. AMP network can incorporate feedback and complex interrelationships between and between clusters so that all the elements in the network can be connected in tandem. This mechanism can provide a more accurate model in complex settings. Owing to the type of information available in AMP, the quality of the experts is more important than their number. Four experts were selected for different approaches to the problem, two urban planners and two climatologists. The following dimensions, criteria and sub-criteria were selected to measure the climatic resilience of the 12th district of Tehran. According to the AMD method, the indicators of climate resilience and sustainability of cities were evaluated in five dimensions. Environmental, social, economic, institutional, and infrastructural. First, the experts scored the desired indicators. And then, AMP was used to calculate the final weight. Finally, the model assessed climate resilience and sustainability variables in Tehran's soil system. You can see the indicators of climate resilience and sustainability of cities on the screen. This figure illustrates the research process conducted in this study. This study identified a set of appropriate and clear criteria. Then the experts gave them points. AMP was applied to evaluate the importance of different indicators for urban resilience and paper comparison learning. As discussed in the previous section, AMP was chosen according to its capacity to consider the mutual interdependencies among the identified indicators. This methodology organized the indicators and urban resilience capacities in clusters and nodes. This figure shows the AMP networks developed for this assessment. As for experts were interviewed, four individual results were obtained. It shows the latest importance according to their judgment. The geometric mean of the judgment of the four experts was used to aggregate the individual priorities. Care was taken to ensure all care was compared and necessary, had a consistency ratio of less than 10 percent. As shown in this figure, the final priorities of the indicators were determined through pair uh, comparison. There is an important consideration regarding the pair comparison among clusters and nodes about urban resilience capacity that we should consider when evaluating these priorities. We must consider pair comparison among clusters and nodes to ensure our decisions are strategically beneficial. We need to consider the potential interactions between different elements. Based on AMP model results, compensation, institutional relations, and building situations are considered very important. According to these results, urban planning rules compliance, air pollution, participation of institutions and people, helping each other, trained people, insurance, and people awareness of climatic hazards are the most relevant criteria. The importance of temporary housing, internet access, sexual ratio, access to fire stations, aspect, slope, and resident ownership is less critical for urban resilience. Historically, this area and its buildings are ancient. Because of the high density of people in this area, traffic, and air pollution, 
It's not suitable for the facilities of this area to withstand climatic hazards. Under different scenarios, Tehran and this area may also experience an increase in temperature and a decrease in precipitation by the year 2100. In Tehran's 12th district, climate resilience is low. These results are like previous research such as Hassanpur et al. and Amir's Aslani. This area has several challenges, including its old texture, urban heat island because of heavy traffic, lack of open and green spaces, and high population density, all of which contribute to its low resilience. The area is prone to extreme weather events such as heat rate, drought, inundation, and overflow. This makes it more vulnerable to climate change. Finally, the area is also plagued with air pollution, a significant health risk for the population. Complying with urban planning rules, reducing air pollution, participation of institutions and people, helping each other, training people, insurance, and people's awareness of climatic hazards can improve urban resilience. In District 12 of Tehran, the most important criteria are compliance with urban planning rules and air pollution. This report identifies these two factors as crucial factors in improving urban resilience. As far as urban resilience capacities are concerned, temporary housing and internet access are less important. Promoting urban development requires increased investment in reducing air pollution. By doing so, urban resistance will be improved. In addition, compliance with urban planning rules can enhance urban resilience. Therefore, changing management methods and implementing strategies to encourage citizen participation are necessary to comply with urban planning. Also, green areas must be developed and ecological friendly way of living must be adopted and an ecological urban environment must be constructed. This research indicated that Tehran 12th district is not resilient to climate change. There is a need for a fundamental transformation to improve this situation and condition. As part of the process of addressing the challenges of this area and increasing the resilience, these things should be observed. Development of the area through regeneration and improvement. Preventing the aggravating wear and tear of biological spaces in the tissue. Participation in regeneration and renovation through financial support. Enhancing the quality and strength of the building. Implementation of a comprehensive plan for transportation and traffic control development in this area. Thank you so much for your interest and attention. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, the, the floor is yours, Professor Fanny. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mogadam and the uh, presenter, Ms. Ahadi and Dr. Kalantari. Uh, if uh, there is any question. Uh, we are here, <laughs> however, the presenters isn't here, aren't here. <laughs> um, because of something technical problems. So, um, uh, yes, I think we have uh, Professor Kalantari here with us, I guess. Uh, no, uh, Mohsen is Abbas Najad. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Okay. So um, I think we can move on to the next presentation. Yes, yes, sure. yes. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. In the name of the Most High, 
Hello and welcome to all you present the scholars and researchers in this conference and a special thanks to those involved in this situation. It's a great honor for us to be among you and I hope the research results will be beneficial and helpful for this situation to achieve its scientific goals. I'm Mohsen Abbas Nejat Jelogir, PhD candidate in Geography and Event Planning in University of Tehran and this research is extracted from my master thesis in Beishti University, which was done with the help of Dr. Lotvali Kuzegar Kaleji and Dr. Parviz Agai. I'm going to start the topics with a short article. In this part and as introduction, we want to explain more about urban and neighborhood sustainable development and some theories in case of neighborhood development and traditional markets. The global need to move toward the sustainability at the national and local or urban levels intensified and plans and actions to realize the sustainable development objectives were placed on the agenda of national and local governments during 1987 by proposing the theory of sustainable development and emerging the concept of sustainable urban development in the world literature at the end of the second millennium AD. However, the passage of several decades and global surveys has uh, revealed a large number of obstacles in achieving the objectives of sustainable development. The functional scale should be reduced uh, along with other measures by uh, um, focusing on smaller areas such as neighborhood units, resulting in offering concepts such as sustainable neighborhood development. Here we study three groups of theories related to neighborhood development. The first group is in line with the objectives of neoliberalism. The second one is reviewed as the critical theories of neighborhood development. And the last one is placed between the aforementioned two currents. Based on theories of the first category, neighborhood development is considered as an instrument to create an entrepreneurial city which is regarded an, uh, as attractive visually and attracts large investments to compete in the global era. The second category includes more uh, criteria, uh, critical theories focusing on community lead and neighborhood development as a process which uh, lays the um, groundwork for people's participation and changing the top-down process of the development. Further, local community economic development, CED, the idea of micro and social businesses and Muhammad Yunus's ideas can be introduced as the third category of development theories as the boundary between the two main indicated currents, which is not considered as the uh, dominance approach. But uh, the theories have been criticized and it seems that uh, these theories uh, have failed to achieve their goals, which is the development of the neighborhood. So, beside these theories, we should refer to traditional markets. The element of traditional markets is among the critical potential which can exist in the neighborhood and has not yet been regarded in the development of urban neighborhoods. Traditional markets have always been considered as the beating heart in cities throughout history with different function and appropriate potential in responding to different needs of urban society. Based on the literature, the traditional market play a critical role in strengthening and weakening the local economy, social relations, cultural diversity, and the like, 
despite their problems in the current situation. Based on the background, the traditional markets in a large number of Islamic cities can be applied to achieve neighborhood development objectives, especially in poor neighborhoods. However, the urban markets, traditional street ones, appear to be neglected as one of the assets in the neighborhoods. So we should say this study seeks to examine the Nematabad furniture market in Tehran as a symbol for a traditional street market by investigating its prosperity situation in different dimensions of development and probable relationship with neighborhood development dimensions in the region. About the cases that we should say, the Nematabad neighborhood is an area of about 150 uh, hectares is located in the northern part of Region 3 in District 19 in Tehran. And uh, based on the statistical center of Iran, uh, 36,941 people, including 1,792 women and uh, 19, uh, 19,031 men, lived in Nematabad during uh, 2016. Also, based on the studies, ethnicity, language, and religion are among the most critical factors in distributing social and ethnic groups. Uh, most of residents in this neighborhood are Azari speaking due to their uh, same uh, migration uh, origin. Residents in, uh, in this neighborhood are uh, religiously un united and mostly follow the uh, Shia religion. As you can see, uh, physically about 13.5% uh, of the 150 hectares area of Nematabad with an area of uh, 20 hectares uh, is considered as uh, worn out and 2.5% includes unstable urban tissue. In addition, 7,967 people in Nematabal live in its uh, dilapidated uh, structures. Based on the observations, the highest uses in the area during 2018 included residential, residential, commercial, and commercial respectively. Also, as you can see with a red line on the map, Nematabad Furniture Market includes uh, Noor, Jambaz, and uh, Puriyai Valley streets, three main streets in the, uh, in the eastern uh, part of the Nematabad. Our study uh, is considered as applied and descriptive and article in terms of nature and method, uh, respectively. And the uh, population included uh, two groups, including the businessman in the Nematabad furniture market and residents uh, in western and eastern parts of the neighborhood, except, uh, except the businessman. Approximately about 800, 1,000 shops are located in the furniture market. And uh, by random systematic sampling method, uh, finally, uh, 236 shops were uh, selected as a sample with a certain order and three times in uh, between. And so all, the, uh, all of the shops in the market were uh, covered, uh, except uh, inactive ones. Although, based on the uh, Cochrane's formula, 381 participation selected for a sample among 37,000 people, and this number uh, divided between the eastern and western parts uh, with uh, using a non-random uh, non CODA uh, method. In this research, our independent variables were market performance, future state of the market, and current market situation, and dependent variables were social, cultural development, economic development, and physical development. And finally, the data uh, were analyzed based on descriptive and inferential statistics. In the first part, uh, we use frequency distribution methods. Uh, in the second part, we use some uh, parametric tests uh, such as 
sample t-test for uh, compare the estimated average and Pearson correlation test um, to uh, check the correlation between the two population under investigation including the nematabot furniture market and residents. In this part, uh, we want to speak about uh, the characteristics of the uh, participations. Uh, as you can see on the shape, most of the questionnaires among the businessmen and in the neighborhood uh, have been men. Although uh, most of the uh, questionnaires among uh, businessmen uh, have been single, uh, but uh, most of the uh, questionnaires in the neighborhood um, have been uh, married. And about the age, most of the questionnaires among uh, businessmen uh, have been uh, young. So we should say the Nematabot furniture market has attracted the youths of the neighborhood, especially the youths of the eastern part of the Nematabot. In this part, and according to the results, we want to uh, explain more about uh, Nematabot furniture market. The main function of the market includes uh, buying and selling secondhand goods as well as uh, producing and selling some kinds of household appliances, especially wooden ones, uh, industrial steel and the like. Uh, as you can see on the shape, average market performance 3.21, which includes its current and future status, uh, is higher than the mean, uh, indicating its uh, relatively active functioning. And the mean for the future status of the market is regarded as the highest. The organic and natural growth of the market as well as uh, lack of action and intervention of urban management have led to the absence of ap uh, appropriate infrastructure and urban furniture necessary for a living and a successful market. Uh, based on the field observations and face-to-face -face interview, the Nematabot furniture market with a large number of customers has only one toilet and lacks drinking fountains, paving stones, recreational facilities, police station, television advertisements, rule to prevent entry and exit of cars, uh, high production standards and after-sales services. Uh, the number of ATMs is uh, extremely limited in this market. However, the furniture market has increased the vitality in the eastern part of the neighborhood uh, through the entry and exit of visitors. Also, according to the residents and businessmen, the activity in the market has altered the historical negative image of the neighborhood, which was among the uh, most critical places for uh, crime and street fights, uh, resulting in uh, forming a new uh, image based on the production and sale, uh, sale of uh, wooden uh, accessories, uh, furniture, and the like. In addition, the unfair distribution of uh, wells created by the market is among the negative results of its prosperity. In order to explain the level of development in the neighborhood, various indices were used in physical, economic, and social cultural dimensions. Based on the results, the average for economic cultural development in the eastern part is considered as higher than the western one. Although job opportunities and uh, willingness to invest for uh, the development of businesses within the neighborhood have increased in the eastern part more than the western one during the recent years. And according to the residents, the furniture market in the eastern part has been more uh, effective in creating employment and uh, reducing uh, neighborhood poverty uh, compared to the western one. Based on the results, 
the traffic and congestion of vehicles, roadblocks in the sidewalks, and uh, disturbance in passing through uh, streets and uh, alleys in the whole neighborhood, especially in the eastern part, have raised uh, due to increasing physical and functional expansion of the uh, market during the last uh, five years. In addition, the amount and number of constructions by uh, native and old residents in the neighborhood as well as the uh, tendency to build in the eastern part has uh, increased more than the western one. It's very interesting to know that uh, most of the businessmen in the market live in the upper floors of their shop uh, in, the, uh, in the eastern part and usually uh, reconstruct their uh, entire uh, residential units to renovate the uh, shop. In other words, a part of the financial benefits related to the market are invested in the neighborhood and constructing the buildings, although most of uh, such constructions are regarded as non-standard in terms of uh, engineering and are uh, performed without the supervision of urban management. Finally, as you can see on the shape, the mean uh, physical development in the eastern part is considered as um, higher than the western one. So as you can see on the shape, as a whole, the amount of the neighborhood development dimensions in the eastern part is higher than the uh, western one. About uh, relationship between Nematabot furniture market and uh, neighborhood development, uh, and based on the uh, results, among uh, all possible relationships, this research can uh, show some significant uh, correlation between uh, research variables. There is significant correlation between uh, market performance and sociocultural development in the eastern part. And there are uh, significant correlations between uh, current situation of the market and whole dimension of neighborhood development except uh, social cultural development in the eastern part. And last one, there is significant correlation between future situation of the market and social cultural development in the eastern part of the uh, Nematabot. In this slide, I'm going to put uh, more emphasis on uh, some important uh, points about uh, Nematabot furniture market. It has grown organically, lacks any urban infrastructure required by such a market, has become the brand of the neighborhood, eliminated the famous and negative historical statements about its history as a place for crime and uh, street fights, has created employment especially in the eastern part resulting in reducing the past street fights between youths, minimizing the distance between work and home for a large number of the residents. The profit obtained from the furniture market is uh, invested in the neighborhood for the reconstruction and re, uh, renovation of units since most of the uh, businessmen in the market are considered as the residents in the region. In this research, we introduced another model of neighborhood development besides three main models uh, that we mentioned uh, in the introduction part. Such a model needs uh, external intervention and organization in its flourishing stage in the current situation to continue its intended process by uh, creating uh, appropriate urban uh, infrastructures, managing the uses and the like. Generally, examples of community-oriented development can emerge uh, spontaneously without external help grow and even flourish like the Nematabot furniture market. However, creating and improving urban infrastructure, developing, organizing, distributing the income from the market fairly, and legalizing the behavior require the supervision and legislation of the 
uh, urban management body which is formed by a bottom-up and top-down flow. Finally, as a suggestion, uh, we should say the Nematabad neighborhood should be organized due to increasing physical and functional expansion of its market uh, in order to minimize its negative effects such as congestion and roadblocks, traffic barriers, noise created uh, by loading through the uh, through the integration of uh, residential and workshop uses and the like as well as uh, distributing the benefits of the market differently and fairly among the residents. Finally, I would like to express my special thanks to all who were involved in this conference. I hope that the scientific efforts of uh, urban researchers will create a more stable world, uh, not only in all the world, but also in all cities and neighborhoods. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Abbas Nejad and uh, his colleagues uh, with this uh, interesting subject about uh, neighborhood development uh, and in relation to uh, markets uh, in Nematabad. I should uh, hear uh, and not uh, have a note about the uh, paper of Mr. Zargami. Uh, it doesn't um, he doesn't uh, complete uh, that uh, and uh, I just uh, like to um, have a uh, abstract of it. Uh, Mr. Zargami, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, have been uh, have uh, sick uh, and uh, 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 it's not complete to, uh, the paper isn't uh, complete to uh, present. But it's about searching for urban resilience in Tehran metropolitan. Uh, urban resilience uh, has been a solution to reduce human and natural or origin uh, damages for several decades in global studies. A substantial number of studies have addressed different aspects of resilience. Therefore, in the past few decades, uh, resilience has been considered as a few a paradigm among development organizations. To survive in a, a turbulent and changing world, Tehran Metropolitan uh, was evaluated uh, due to uh, the high concentration of population and economic activities. In addition, this metropolitan uh, has faced many challenges, including inefficiency of the institutional environment, centralized and top-down management, climate change, worn out texture, land use change, high building density, lack of the uh, proper in infrastructure development, and uh, improper uh, distribution of uh, green and open spaces. This paper uh, aimed to analyze uh, Tehran metropolitan resilience based on physical, economic, uh, social, environmental, and institutional dimensions. The research method is mixed uh, for analyzing the institutional environment uh, in relation to resilience, uh, qualitative methods uh, have been used, but and for measuring uh, vulnerability and uh, resilience, uh, quantitative methods have been employed. The results show that the resilience situation is low in terms of infrastructure and physical structure, 
تهران متروپولیس از هایلی ولنور و اند پراکسیمیتی تو ده ارثکویک فالت فالتس های دنسیتی آف بیلدینگز اند پاپولیشن اند لو لیول آف کانسترکشن تکنولوژی are the most important factors in uh, reducing resilience. Ultimately, one of the main obstacles uh, to increasing resilience is the impact of the political economy on the institutional develop uh, environment. This, is a, uh, this was a, um, uh, an abstract of uh, Mr. Zarghami's paper. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Amogadam. Please uh, play the another. Uh, yes, Professor. But before that, uh, I have a question for Mohsen that uh, regarding his research about, uh, about the role of traditional markets that can lead to neighborhood development. And uh, it was a really interesting actual research. And uh, it has a a very good case study the name at about i know that place from many years ago i don't know if uh, we have professor alan kane here i don't know if he remembers those places in tehran also or not anyway but the question is that uh, using traditional markets or uh, as a you know a kind of the injecting uh capital to a neighborhood that has significant issues like uh, old, for example, buildings or context or fabric or tissue or something like that, uh, will, wouldn't increase the land value and uh, maybe not immediately, but in five or 10 years, uh, it will evacuate it from its original uh, settlers. Uh, I mean, maybe in five or 10 years, people that used to live there cannot afford that place anymore. Uh, I wanted to know your perspective based on your research. Uh, Mr. Mohsen uh, is here, but I don't know. Uh, he... Maybe access to access to um, an instrument, for example, a speaker. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, uh, yes, Alan. Yeah. Good. Good afternoon or um, morning. I guess if you're in, uh, if you're in. Um, in Ottawa, or good evening if you're in Tehran. Um, yes, I was interested. Um, uh, I mean, I haven't been to um, Iran for many years, but um, the um, um, the the concept of informality. I mean, the um, the market area that um, uh, that Mosem studied is that. Um, considered uh, a regularized, you know, zoned um, urban area um, that um, um, where the the market is considered um, uh, a formal market or um, we've been doing some interesting work on a study uh, called the architecture of informal markets. And uh, uh, it's an international study um, that looks at um, informal markets around the world. Um, um, I can share the, some of the research, but um, I'm interested if the, um, uh, the furniture market is considered uh, formalized or informal. And in Iran, how do you define uh, formality or informality, um, uh, whether they're registered, whether they pay taxes, uh, um, some of the definitions so thanks and i'm uh please thank you for sending me the, the, the link i'd forgotten the password okay no worries thanks thank you alan actually i would love to hear from Mohsen himself as a researcher i'm not sure if 
is uh, right now available to us. But as your question, my knowledge is kind of old. <laughs> it's not new. Uh, but I think the the formality that 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 furniture market is kind of a formal one, and it was um, uh, although they had some kind of participation, uh, but the the whole thing was kind of from top to bottom, and it was uh, it was it it had all of the you know. Uh, it, it applied for all the regulations and resolution to my knowledge. And uh, it was actually uh, a place for uh, a capital and neoliberalism there. But it was helpful also, you know, at the same time, it was a place because uh, Tehran has a very expensive land price, you know, and uh, that place because of the informal settlements and all uh, urban fabric uh, has had actually uh, a, little, a little bit low prices and it was really interesting because of the, the, I think about the, the transportation accesses it's really important in Iran you know access into highways and expressways uh, it was a unique place that uh, some major uh, you know uh, franchise uh, was really interested to uh, invest on the, on that place but it was uh, helpful in some ways it generates some uh, revenue and that revenue is spent it on that place i would love i would like to see more pictures if mosen was here and could have showed us those pictures after the you know all the renovation etc but in the regarding to your question about the formality or an informal market so informal informal market is there it's not it's like a street vendors you know uh they cannot have specific buildings with you know some uh uh, business running the without uh, having their papers from you know different organization like municipality and some ministries offices yeah and they have also to pay taxes okay so they've um, effectively formalized um, yes. um, street trading and this kind of thing yes yes yeah my my question was and the the Research we've been doing on informal markets was around criminalizing informality or criminalizing poverty, basically. So, um, but uh, yeah, that's really interesting. If there's any, if um, uh, Mosem uh, could share uh, that that paper in a um, in a manuscript form, that would be very interesting to look at. And thanks very much. Sure, I will follow that. Thank you. So if we don't have any questions, we can proceed to the next presentation, I guess. I think we have the presentation from Ms. Alahe Aflaki Samani or Somani, something like that. A warm welcome to the distinguished participants of the ICCCASU conference, and esteemed panel members. I am Alehi Aflaki Samani, a PhD student in Geography and Urban Planning at Shahid Beheshti University, Tehran, Iran. I am delighted to present our research on spatial development and the role of phased development-oriented planning in addressing, in addressing inequalities focusing on a compelling case study of Chabahar, Iran, conducted in collaboration with my esteemed professor, Dr. Zara Feni. In many developing countries, rapid spatial development in specific regions leads to side effects such as the emergence of impoverished and marginalized areas. This research contends that as these areas have been affected by macro-level interventions, a phased approach on macro, meso, and micro scales is crucial to tackle and alleviate the inequalities. Our study suggests that by implementing a phased development or development-oriented planning strategy, we can effectively address and reduce the negative impacts of such developments. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to sharing more insights on our case study and the broader implications of our research. For a brief introduction, let me acquaint you with Chabahar.
Shabahar is a strategically located port city in east-southeastern Iran, situated on the Gulf of Oman. Its key significance lies in being the closest Iranian port to the Indian Ocean. The city's focal point is the Chabahar port. A deep water seaport that not only grants India access to Afghanistan and Central Asia but also serves as a vital element of the International North-South Transport Corridor INSTC. This corridor aims to facilitate trade and transit among India, Iran, Afghanistan, and other Central Asian nations. Chabahar has garnered international attention for its potential to foster economic development in the region, reducing Afghanistan's reliance on neighboring ports and positioning itself as a pivotal hub for regional trade. Now, let's delve into the problem at hand. In developing countries, regional spatial development often leads to unintended side effects, such as an influx of rural to urban migration and the subsequent expansion of informal settlements in cities, resulting in social, economic, and spatial inequalities. This study focuses on Chabahar, a city in Sistan and Baluchestan province of Iran, which has, which has experienced the impacts of large-scale regional spatial development, including the proliferation of informal settlements in its surrounding villages and the associated negative secondary effects. The primary question driving this research is, what framework is suitable for regional development to address marginalization and achieve equalities? Furthermore, the main goals of this research are First, sustainable regional development Second, reduction of inequalities So, to address the posed question, we one first delve into the nature and reasons behind the formation and expansion of informal settlements in these regions. This marginalized phenomenon is influenced by several key factors, including 1. International capital investments 2. Competitive spatial development speed and the challenge of regional balance. 3. Developing transportation lines. 4. Widespread migration in pursuit of job opportunities. 5. Regional challenges and water resource shortages. Given Iran's arid climate and changing environment, regional challenges and the lack of water resources stand out as significant drivers for migrations and the formation of informal settlements. Moving into the analysis of the phenomenon of informal settlements development from 2005 to 2023, we observe that the contiguous area around the city of Chabahar, initially initiated with scattered villages and small settlements, has rapidly fallen under the occupation of informal settlements due to extensive migration. This has taken the city by surprise, as the population in this area has surged from approximately 2,500 to 40,000 residents, many of whom are undocumented refugees and rural dwellers seeking a better life on the outskirts of the city to pursue their aspirations. The methodology employed in this research follows the operational framework approach to phased development-oriented planning. Consequently, in each of the three main phases, a structured decision-making process is implemented as follows. In the first stage, operating in the macroscale phase, the selection of indicators and criteria takes precedence. Through collaboration with various experts in the field, field suitable priorities for indicators and criteria are established, culminating in the formulation of a comprehensive spatial development map for the region. Delving into the Delphi Methods application in this research, a consensus building technique, involving academic elites, local managers, urban planning professionals, and high-level ministry managers, was adopted across six key steps, selection, selection of experts, questionnaire design, individual responses, group feedback, consensus building, and final report. For the final inference from Delphi group opinions, a hierarchical analysis model in the IPERT choice software is utilized. This incorporates paired comparison values, final weights for criteria and indicators, facilitating comprehensive planning for regional spatial development based on these outcomes. These same steps are mirrored in the second stage, focusing on the mesoscale phase for the Chabahar city, Har city area and its surroundings. The criteria and indicators for this scale are selected in collaboration with the Delphi group, assigning specific weights to ensure optimal decision-making for proposed zoning and functions in each area. The subsequent phase follows a similar structure in the microscale, aiming to achieve the ultimate goal of mitigating spatial inequalities. The strategic challenges requiring the Delphi Group's attention across all three phases involve water and critical resources, diverse transport line development, population and services capacity, financial capability, regional and international competitions, accessibility, stability, spatial balance and service distribution, and ecological capability and risk management. Introducing the development-oriented scale phase planning strategy, by implementing appropriate measures and resource allocation in development-prone areas, we can effectively reduce inequalities and foster sustainable growth in the region. This involves zoning to divide development programs into smaller, manageable sections, explaining and weighting indicators for prioritization, and policy-making in each zone for efficient resource and time management. First step is zoning. 
to dividing development programs into smaller and more manageable sections, in each scale phase. Next step is explanation and weighting indicators. To prioritizing indicators to achieve goals. Final step is policy making in zones. To managing better resources and time. The hierarchical analysis model and weighting results within the Delphi team at the macro level indicate that the most significant values are associated with macro level management policies. The key indicators, in order, relate to the competitive perspective at the international, national and local levels, the role on upper level approval documents, and economic infrastructures, supportive capital reproductions and employment, which fall under the infrastructure capacities category. Consequently, the optimal regional spatial structure for the macro scale would comprise zoning for the entire Chibaha region, including the airport, free trade zone, urban rural area, port area, industrial area, and refinery area. Moving to the next phase, which focuses solely on spatial development in the urban rural area, effective factors in urban growth and weighting results from the AHP method for achieving sustainable development are highlighted. Here, transportation and communication network related indicators take precedence, emphasizing access to transportation networks, urbanized lands, barren lands, and urban reserves. Thurves. Although indicators like access to residential support services and physical and structural factors retain importance, transportation and communication networks, along with political and administrative factors, hold the highest value in decision making at the MISO scale. Consequently, the proposal suggests dividing the region into five main areas, each catering to specific functions. One offshore islands, two metropolitan area, tower residential, retail slash commercial, hotel and resort, Todd. Three urban area, residential, low slash medium density. Four backup metropolitan area, office space, indus, industries, outlets. Five conservation area. The most crucial connecting element between these areas is the light rail transit, LRT, ring, which, accompanied by the main access network structure, harmonizes the proposed spatial structure zones in this phase. Now let's show you the perspective of spatial structure at mesoscale phase.
Now welcome back at microscale phase. The crux lies in the microscale, the pivotal and executable phase culminating in action plans within the urban area, where informal settlements have taken root. Factors effective in rehabilitating marginalized areas, weighed through the AHP method to address micro-level inequalities, were intricately discussed within the Delphi team. Prioritization, shaped by consensus, allocated greater significance to urban management and justice, 0.295, and economy, 0.283. The indices' existence of protective laws and regulations and insurance and financial support garnered utmost importance. Existing marginalized area, in micro-scale phase, is located in urban area at meso-scale phase plan. Executing action plans involved assessing land management through the sleuth analysis technique and evaluating the best locations for service accessibility, utilizing indicators like land uses and service accessibility. Slope end. Hill shade. Transportation and Topography Urban and Rural Area Excluded Area Faults Location Excluded Area Exposure to Flood Excluded Area Exposure to Tsunami Risk SLEUTH analysis output. Convenient and inconvenient zones. For settlements and activities. Existence land use in marginalized area. Build quality. In marginalized area. Build oldness. In marginalized area. Build structure. In marginalized area. Build floors. In marginalized area. Achieving equilibrium between scales is imperative, balancing environmental aspects, prioritizing resident well-being, and aligning with national perspectives. The Strategic Development Plan for the Urban Area, unfolding in three phases, aspires to elevate the micro-study area to meet Chabahar City's quality of services and residents, aligning with national and super-regional needs. This approach, pos approach positions it competitively for sustainable spatial development in line with the envisioned national vision. The culmination of these three phases is the development-oriented time-bound planning, aligning with expert opinions on service distribution patterns and residential enhancement policies. Essentially, these macro, meso, and micro-scale phases prepare the ground for two sub-action phases, delineating the marginalized area for the two population receiving periods. Also evaluation of land and housing policies in urban area are used to zoning in urban area to propose actionable plan. All these policies are applied to addressing inequalities. In the ultimate stage of designing a suitable model to enhance urban life in marginalized zones, a GIs-based spatial organization is employed. This approach integrates diverse layers to propose an effective spatial structure for the designated area in the action phase. Microscales, supplemented by microscale sub-action phases, the proposal stands as a nuanced developmental approach. Weighing of factors by the Delphi Group, validated through expert choice software, forms the bedrock of the proposed actionable plan. First sub-action phase and first popular wave, first sub-action on the micro-scale phase. Initiating with the current structural condition, this phase aims to address severe housing problems and organize informal housing. It prioritizes areas conducive to initial development, focusing on barren lands or reserves in prior approved plans. In tandem with the first popular wave, local plans are, plans are detailed, systematically allocating designed plots based on approved plans and spatial characteristics. The second sub-action phase and second popular wave, second sub-action on the micro-scale phase commencing local development in the first period, short to mid-term horizon, this phase anticipates urban expansion in Chabahar City. Efforts focus on housing and services development to meet existing needs. In the second period, local development aligns with the city's structure, aiming for the gradual disappearance of appearance of informal settlements in the mid-term horizon. Main structure in urban area. Existence residential and services. Proposal residential and services. Urban Services Mixed Area Zone Conserved Area for Future Developments Commercial Corridors and Neighbor Schools Commercial Corridors and Urban Schools Megapolitan Main Corridor Structural Corridor for Urban Area Pedestrian Way Sea View Corridors Finally, achieving equilibrium between scales is imperative, balancing environmental aspects, prioritizing resident well-being, and aligning with national perspectives.
the Strategic Development Plan for the Urban Area, unfolding in three phases, aspires to elevate the micro-study area to meet Chabahar City's quality of services and residents, aligning with national and mid-term regional needs. This approach positions it competitively for sustainable spatial development in line with the envisioned national vision. The amalgamation of spatial development and meticulous phased development-oriented planning is pivotal in addressing inequalities in the coordinated development of Chabahar's marginalized area. Across macro, meso, and micro scales, supplemented by micro scale sub action phases, the, propo the proposal stands as a nuanced developmental approach. Rigorous weighing of factors by the Delphi Group, validated through expert choice software, forms the bedrock of the proposed actionable plan. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your beautiful presentation and also giving us a very nice looking uh, videos about the plan that was, I think, really impressive. Uh, Professor Fanny. Uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, you and other colleagues in this meeting, especially uh, Professor Allen. Uh, I uh, should thanks uh, special thanks to Alan about uh, former um, paper uh, from Mohsen. Uh, I I uh, should not a uh, uh, a main uh, uh, issue about uh, this paper and uh, former paper. Uh, the base theory has uh, covered this research and former paper is, uh, I think, uh, political uh, political economy that has main effects on uh, constructions uh, and housing in the Iranian cities. Uh, indeed, uh, there are many uh, valuable studies about uh, urban planning, uh, urban development in Iran, uh, about uh, Iranian cities, but uh, I think uh, political decisions uh, have influenced uh, all uh, policies and plans in cities of Iran. Uh, this is a main uh, subject uh, about uh, Iranian studies uh, in uh, about uh, cities, um, I think. Dr. Mogadam? Yes, that was actually really correct. Uh, when we are talking about the urban problem in Iran, we usually think mostly about the political economy and its effects. It's really uh, kind of twisted to get uh, two uh, perspectives that are not really uh, combinable. I don't think it's a word. But yeah, we have an authority, authoritarian and uh, mostly with some left ideas at, as a government or state. And also we try to uh, kind of uh, fuel the development with neoliberal or even capitalism ideas. That's, that's uh, you know... Uh, a paradox that we are living in Iran about it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I uh, I should to tell here um, that uh, uh, all changes in the neighborhoods of cities in Iran uh, are affected uh, by uh, uh, political decisions and. Uh, uh, capital, not uh, not uh, 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 factors that cause the uh, formal or informal. It's not a main issue, and the main issue is uh, 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 effects of uh, capital and uh, political decisions in urban planning, urban. Uh, policies and so on. Yes. And also we have Alan. Yes, Alan. Um, okay, well, thank you. Um, I agree. My question was um, 
uh, was was uh, really the same or related to um, uh, Professor Fani's. Um, the um, and it it was a question that I, I I'm not sure if the presenter uh, is in a position to answer, but um, it's um, one is um, this presentation was obviously a, a to some extent a commercial presentation by developers who were trying to um, attract financing for the project. And I'm curious to know who um, who um, it's targeted at. I mean, who, um, is it the Iranian government? Is it uh, um, commercial and foreign investors? We have many projects like um, proposals like this in, um, uh, for African cities as well. And I, I think this is very interesting. Um, again, um, from the African perspective, we could share some papers around um, these, this, these new city um, concepts. I, a lot of them are inspired by cities like Dubai and, and um, um, uh, but um, this is a, a, a Gulf city, so maybe um, maybe there is uh, financing for for cities like this. I, I was curious if there was um, if the overall concept was related to the Belt and Road um, program, the Chinese finance program, or the alternative. Um, I know the um, Americans and, and Indians are trying to develop uh, an alternative um, uh, to the Belt and Road, and um, maybe the concept relates to, to that. Um, but again, um, as uh, Professor Fani um, mentioned, um, these are political and economic um, uh, decisions, and I, you know, I'd be very interested to um, learn more about um, um, you know the the political economy behind this project. It seems like a um, uh, a very interesting project. There's a outlet for um, for Afghanistan, and uh, but there's the similar project uh, I think in Pakistani Baluchistan um, that is part of the Belt and Road um, uh, links with um, uh, through uh, from. Uh, I know China is also looking for uh, an outlet to the sea, and um, that uh, so there's. It seems to be, in political terms, a parallel project to the uh, to the um, to the Belt and Road project that um, is probably quite nearby. Well, relatively. Anyway, <laughs> those are my comments. Thanks. No, yeah, that's actually it's great, actually, and I think the the. If uh, the researchers are here, I'm, I'm sure that Professor Fandy can uh, answer those questions. Uh, and so your question was about, first of all, this kind of the, the, the commercial uh, proposals. Uh, who is the target? Are they uh, developed all those designs and 3Ds for governments or uh, getting, I don't know, maybe foreign capitals or foreign uh, private sector uh, international private sector to do that and also I know that the Chabahar is very old city maybe uh, it's really really old city and also uh, so uh, so is it a competitive to the road that American or Western countries try to create to kind of the uh, kind of a work around uh, for the the, the, the I forgot the name the, the, the we called it in Iran tanky hormones, which is the, a, a pivotal point between the Saudi Arabia and all the uh, you know all the oil transportation from the Persian Gulf to the old world. And uh, yeah, uh, I think we have Luisa also here. Professor Fani, do you want to answer Alex? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, and thank you. 
Thanks uh, a lot, um, Professor Allen. Uh, um, like many researchers, urban researchers in Iran, uh, the um, targets uh, of uh, this research uh, are uh, trade in, institution, in institutions and governments, both, and, uh, and because uh, they are uh, uh, benefits uh, uh, benefit uh, in uh, from in, in this uh, uh, plans and projects. Uh, it's so uh, it's so difficult to discuss here uh, about uh, uh, exact uh, this research because the. Uh, this research is a, a future uh, has contained a future plan, a future uh, landscape uh, uh, that uh, uh, should uh, uh, be uh, con concentrate uh, concentration by uh, government uh, and uh, local uh, responsibilities uh, about uh, planning and urban planning. Uh, Luisa Gomez, please. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so, hi, Navid, and hi, Ellen. I uh, just joined uh, recently, so I saw, only really saw this one presentation, uh, but I am with Alan in the same uh, perspective that it seems to me that it is like there was very little consultative uh, process in this uh, last presentation. Sort of, um, I wonder what the people like if if there was if if, if individuals in in the slums areas were are even aware of this development plans or were they consulted of like what is it that they they will like if 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 they want to remain in this area and if if so I mean all this very important part because I I think that is. Uh, well proven that it, without that consultation it's probably a lot of um, backlash uh, from the communities and more difficulties in in the planning and also like at the end the rest of, like the community won't take care of of the area as much if, it, if they're not included in the consulting process so um, I don't know if the researcher is here and if that if they could explain that a little bit further that would be great thank you Thank you so much, Luisa. Yes, I think Ms. Elohe Afloki is here with us right now. I'm not sure if uh, she can explain more about it from the perspective of the, the local residents, as you mentioned, Luisa here. Oh, yes, go ahead, Elohe. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi everybody. Yeah, and uh, thank you. I'm uh, I'm so uh, appreciated that you uh, that this presentation uh, uh, you you like it. Uh, I want to uh, complete this uh, presentation about the uh, uh, relationship between uh, the government uh, and the uh, local uh, decision. Uh, you know that the uh, mer marginalized uh, area uh, are very hard to uh, decision because of uh, very different aspects of it. Um, so uh, uh, when, we, when we want to uh, manage something like this, uh, we had to uh, have a, a very, um, very soft decision that uh, no people uh, harm uh, in there. And, and it means uh, uh, when we uh, see the people that are poor, uh, that are poor and uh, very uh, uh, have, have nothing to to lose exactly, uh, and uh, on the other side, uh, we have uh, some uh, some uh, megapolitan in uh, our uh, in our uh, future uh, idealistic region uh, that uh, this uh, marginalized area uh, are restrict or uh, this uh, area. It it it, it, it means it, it's uh, some. Um, 
uh, from from a stone that uh, is strict uh, on your uh, achieving our plan. And uh, so uh, uh, when, we, when we want to uh, solve this, uh, as you see, uh, at the uh, macro scale, uh, we have to uh, solve the problem and manage the uh, zones uh, or all of the uh, these uh, uh, chowder away. Uh, so uh, when, uh, when we uh, come to uh, meso level, uh, we have to uh, uh, establish some zoning uh, that could uh, work with together and uh, and could uh, uh, have have some. Uh, 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 has some um, integrated area with the uh, main city. I mean, uh, Chawar and uh, the, this uh, rural uh, area have uh, connected each other. Uh, so uh, it means uh, when this, uh, area that where rural area that uh, change to marginalized area uh, are uh, stick on this place. We have to uh, decide that uh, very soft and very low uh, level to uh, put the people uh, rehabilitation there, uh, and, and means uh, uh, step by step uh, have the face to face uh, conversation with these people to uh, have uh, move on uh, all these people to the safe place and uh, have uh, uh, some uh, investigation from the uh, margin, uh, the, uh, the mega uh, industry to have to uh, have housing, uh, have to uh, establish some housing here. Uh, sorry if I can't, I can't so uh, explain so well that I'm so excited. Uh, and uh, now uh, uh, at the uh, sub uh, zero mega uh, sub zero uh, meso uh, micro scale, uh, uh, we have to see that uh, uh, the team uh, have some uh, approval uh, uh, approval ideal idealistic. Uh, uh, um, have have some uh, ideal 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 um, uh, method that that we have to uh, absorb uh, some people that want to uh, place here, and uh, uh, in the other hand, uh, we have to uh, absorb some uh, investigation from the nation and uh, international. Uh, to uh, have to uh, balance our in in uh, in equality here. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So, if I want to sum up with some of the uh, points that you mentioned, so for many years, uh, Chabar was neglected uh, among all the decisions. Uh, taken by the, the central government in Iran and uh, the, the sudden, you know, uh, interest on Chabar is usually based on uh, new interest of uh, Russia and China uh, about their connections. This is the, the best, uh, I think, this is one of the best ways that can uh, China, China, uh, Russia can be connected to East Asia through this actually Chabar port and uh, that's uh, make that city be uh, interesting uh, for uh, governments of course and uh, the people there regarding to Louisa question the people there was suffering uh, from you know uh, many problems from different ranges ranges of educational job opportunities and even health condition so uh, any kind of investment on those cities can really help them to have a, a little bit better life but as i understand from 
the, uh, the, the Elias points uh, is that there is there wasn't kind of uh, you know a participation uh, through uh, planning those plans and all uh, future developments uh, and uh, they those marginalized people that live in that city uh they don't have their voices or actually they uh, the government didn't hear the, their voices so but what one question from alan was left alone is this uh, related to the you know the, the the big plan of china trying to uh kind of re revitalization of the silk road revitalize the silk road you know is this part of that or not Ella, actually you... yes okay. actually yes but uh, uh, as you know uh, every government has changed this uh, government uh, because of uh, the um, uh, something that you know that happened in Iran uh, the, uh, the uh, Silk Road uh, will be uh, changed uh, in something that uh, uh, goes uh, actually from Pakistan and then Afghanistan and then something from the north of Iran. Uh, but um, the chobar uh, is uh, still some uh, important port in Iran. Uh, actually, in uh, in competition world, um, uh, you know that Muscat and you know that. Uh, uh, Quarter in Pakistan uh, have have the uh, very uh, important role, and uh, Chabar has lost the uh, importance in the uh, political uh, that uh, in the uh, upper upper case. I mean uh, international. Uh, role. So Chabar is losing the geopolitical role. Uh, based yeah. on the yeah the masket and one city you mentioned in Pakistan developments yes Ale um, Navid I think you've explained it um, very well I mean the 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 the, po the political economy of the of the rationale of the project because it's uh, really um, um, it's the destruction of the North Stream pipeline from um, to Europe that has probably provided the incentive um, for investment in the in in this project. So I I, I think your um, your explanation of the rationale is is really quite clear and probably you know quite accurate. So this is a, a new corridor that um, has been um, has resulted because of the conflict in Ukraine and, and uh, the, the kind of the new Cold War kind of yeah. mentality of, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, that's really important for Russia because Iran is a really safe place for it and it can be connected still to East Asia. Yeah, and you mentioned the new cold war very accurately. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Professor Fandi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, thanks uh, a lot, Mr. Allen and Gomez. Uh, um, um, Ms. Elahe and I are um, uh, working on this uh, project and uh, isn't completed yet. Uh, I hope uh, when it uh, will complete, uh, we uh, publish uh, the results, its results, and uh, uh, we can uh, present uh, more discussion about uh, um, this project and uh, 
like it in Iran, uh, just it. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. So if I uh, oh sorry, uh, if I can just quickly check that if we have the next presentation here with us, I think uh the next presentation is from yes uh Zahra Kalantari from University of Ottawa. Hi everyone, um, today I'm privileged to present our research at uh, the fifth international conference on uh, uh, Canadian, uh, Chinese and African sustainable urbanization titled Achieving Tactical Urbanism During COVID-19 Transforming Underutilized Spaces into Vibrant Urban Area. In the backdrop of uh, unprecedented COVID-19 challenges, uh, our exploration of uh, the urban landscape spotlights a tactical urbanism as a dynamic strategy. Swiftly addressing evolving urban needs, uh, this proactive approach transforms neglected spaces into vibrant hubs of community engagement and resilience, departing from rigid planning paradigms. Recognizing the disruption caused by COVID-19, we stress the need for innovative solutions. Tactical urbanism emerged a purposeful forward thinking approach actively reshaping environment to meet evolving needs. Vivid case studies such as pop-up park, pedestrians friendly installation vividly um, illustrate the uh, revitalization of urban landscape. Highlighting uh, its versatility, uh, tactical urbanism empower communities through swift um, economical interventions, breaking financial barriers. Active um, community engagement is pivotal, uh, ensuring safety is uh, in uh, doing yourself uh, like uh, DIY initiative and uh, uh, fostering creativity. This approach is not merely as a response uh, to challenge, but a transformative journey for urban landscape. Addressing the unprecedented challenge of COVID-19, we acknowledge the closure and fear uh, in the public spaces, declining road traffic, vulnerability of uh, underutilized spaces, intensified disparities, and also uh, the need for uh, re-evaluating re planning paradigms. Uh, unveiling tactical uh, urbanism involved uh, presenting it uh, as a dynamic and adaptable strategy, emphasizing its proactive nature and a uh, role in innovative reshaping. Introducing tactical urbanism uh, involved depicting it uh, as a dynamic and adaptable strategy, highlighting its uh, proactive nature and crucial role in uh, innovating reshaping. Uh, this comprehensive approach focusing on quick, low-cost community strategies empower community with uh, versatility, allowing the reshaping uh, of the environment, ensuring swift implementation, utilizing economical intervention, promoting active community engagement or ensuring safety in doing your self-initiative and also fostering imaginative and community-led approaches. Research problem um, in my uh, article uh, revolve around the critical gap in un understanding decision-making process, motivations, and patterns in tactical urbanism during COVID-19 pandemic. It aims to uh, unravel the uh, factor influencing its uh, adoption and elusive uh, how this initiative contribute to revitalization and uh, resilience. Uh, the key question is that uh, how do the non-serious uh, non um, dynamics of tactical urbanism during the pandemic reshape underutilized spaces. The objectives focus on quick implementation, low-cost strategies, citizen-led in initiative, and evolution um, and evolution. Explore um, decision-making process, uncover motivation, analyze pattern, um, evaluate impact, and proactive insight for a stakeholder. 
This research is significant as a deeper um, our understanding of tactical urbanism transformative potential during COVID-19 pandemic but, uh, by unveiling decision making uh, intricate cases, uh, motivations and patterns. Uh, it uh, informs urban policies, uh, enhance community engagement and guides future initiative uh, in the post pandemic era. It addresses immediate concern of reshaping urban spaces and uh, contribute uh, to the broader discourse uh, on sustainable and resilient urban development. Um, related to my research object, uh, the pivotal slide served to uh, outline the primary objective for our um, research in the ever aligned with uh, uh, our aching them the, uh, of the transformative potential during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the essence of our exploration lies uh, in understanding the, and um, unraveling uh, the dynamic of tactical urbanism in response to the challenges posed by pandemic. Um, exploring transformative uh, potential during COVID-19 is that um, uh, underscore our commitment and delving uh, into the uh, transformative potential that uh, tactical urbanism hold, particularly uh, in the ex uh, context of uh, unique challenges brought out about the COVID-19 pandemic. By exploring the various dimensions of tactical urbanism, we aim um, to uh, unearth insights uh, that contribute um, to the broad other understanding of urban resilience during crisis. Uh, and also the research place a specific emphasis uh, on the uh, key pandemic, uh, key, key principles of tactical urbanism, particularly the strategies reliance on quick implementation and locus in interventions. By highlighting this aspect, we uh, seek to, um, to elucidate how tactical urbanism stands out uh, as an agile and cost uh, effective approach. Uh, crucial in the face of urgent and urban circumstances such as those uh, presented uh, the pandemic. Uh, the objective, uh, the last objective, uh, delve uh, into the role of citizen-led uh, initiative to uh, in the evolution of tactical urbanism, in the emphasis of grassroots origins of um, this strategy uh, and its development of uh, over time. By exploring the uh, evolutionary journey, we aim to uh, shed light on the transformative power that emerge when community actively engage in the reshaping their urban envir environment. This historical perspective uh, provides a foundation um, for understanding the current state of tactical urbanism and its relevance is uh, contemporary urban planning. In a sense, this slide sets um, the stage for our research journey, uh, articulating uh, our focus on transformative potential of tactical urbanism aims um, the pandemic. Uh, with a specific attention into um, its quick implementation, low-cost strategy, and evolution driven by citizen-led shift. Uh, this slide delves into the twofold impact of tactical urbanism, examining uh, its immediate and advantageous and uh, enduring influence, with the focus of its crucial role uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, tactical urbanism. Um, a swiftly increased community participation, addressing short-term um, uh, challenges and uh, fostering unity uh, during crises. Beyond immediate uh, gains, um, our study investigates how tactical urbanism uh, fortifies a sustainable development, shaping dynamic and adaptable uh, urban environments. Uh, this last segment um, uh, related to uh, positioning for the future, um, highlighting tactical urbanism as a strategic uh, post-pandemic approaches, uh, shaping urban landscape and influencing long-term um, development. In fact, this presentation emphasizing tactical urbanism immediate and lasting impacts, addressing pandemic challenges and contributing uh, to resilience um, urban development.
And this section uh, unveiled the historical evolution of tactical urbanism trac uh, tracing its journey from grassroots beginners uh, to a multifaceted approach, uh, exploring its humble origins as a community-driven grassroots movement. Tactical urbanism has evolved uh, into a comprehensive strategy addressing complex urban challenges, emphasizing uh, its significant contribution uh, to positive urban transformation, including revitalization utilizing uh, underutilized spaces and fostering community engagement. Uh, the presentation underscores uh, the tangible impact of tactical urbanism, uh, highlighting its dynamic nature and resilience in uh, responding to evolution or urban challenges. This section provides a comprehensive overview of tactical urbanism evolution, uh, setting the stage for deeper exploration in the subsequent slides. Uh, the urban landscape faced a profound challenge during the pandemic, marked by notable impact on public spaces. Formerly vibrant hubs of uh, social activity experienced closure and noticeable decline in vibrancy. Uh, the fear of contagion uh, coupled um, with reduced road traffic. Um, highlighted by uh, the vulnerability of underutilized spaces exacerbating the, their um, susceptibility. Uh, this scenario underscored the imperative for innovating solutions with tactical urbanism emerging as a strategic response. Uh, the you know, multifaced uh, challenges during the pandemic necessitate, uh, necessitate um, dynamic approaches, especially in reshaping urban spaces and fostering resilience through a strategic like uh, tactical urbanism. And the journey into tactical urbanism uh, as a dynamic response unfolded against um, the backdrop of concept of gains uh, substantial momentum aimed, aimed uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, dynamically transforming underutilized spaces into vibrant urban area. Uh, this study addresses a critical gap uh, in existing literature by delving into the decision-making uh, intricacies uh, associated with tactical urbanism during crises uh, and uh, often overlooked uh, dimension, uh, while recognizing the acknowledged flexibility of tactical urbanism in crisis situations, the motivation driving its uh, adaptation, especially in the pandemic contents, uh, context, um, remain insufficient, uh, sufficiently uh, insufficiently explored. Um, and also moving grassroots uh, and citizen-led um, initiative, uh, this section emphasized the essential grassroots and uh, citizen-led aspect of tactical urbanism, okay, factoring community engagement and empowerment. Uh, these elements use a, a decentralized approach uh, vital for effective crisis response. Uh, this is evidence um, in the addressing immediate pandemic-related challenges, such as uh, closure of public spaces and uh, vulnerability of uh, underutilized area. Uh, tactical urbanism uh, adaptability uh, showcased through innovative use of public spaces um, prove uh, a crucial tool for safety, addressing challenges and contributing um, inclusive uh, urban planning. Uh, in the final segment, uh, adaptability in the um, face of immediate urban challenges, we explore how tactical urbanism symbolized resilience and adaptability and um, the unique uh, challenges posed by COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this section examined uh, its uh, role uh, in addressing health and safety concerns, navigating regulatory hurdles. And, and providing practical solution, emphasizing um, its transformative active uh, impact on uh, um, reimagining and revitalizing uh, urban spaces, tactical urbanism uh, become a dynamic and transformative tool, uh, actively contributing to the inclusive evolution of urban planning. In conclusion, this literature review forms um, the basic uh, basis of uh, our research on tactical urbanism during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it uh, in uncover decision making in cases, motivation and pattern, um, providing vital insight for reshaping urban space and sustainability uh, and uh, fostering resilience. Uh, the review um, seemingly uh, aligned with our research objective emphasizing the exploration of tactical urbanism, transformative potential, uh, focusing on quick implementation, low-cost strategies, citizen-led um, initiatives, and uh, evolution. Uh, 
Uh, this fundamental uh, knowledge enhances our understanding of how tactical um, urbanism contributes to crisis resilience, particularly aimed at uh, the unique challenges um, posed by COVID-19 pandemic. Research methodology, uh, the constructive uh, ground story approach inspired by Charmas, um, divergence uh, from traditional ground story by priorit prioritizing uh, collaborative knowledge constructions and uh, personal reflections. Uh, customized for investigation, investigating um, decision-making process in tactical urbanism during the COVID-19 pandemic. This qualitative method, ex method explores uh, emerge, uh, emerging themes, patterns, and categories specific uh, to motivations, uh, strategy, and community dynamics. Uh, and also, our research is grounded um, grounded in the relativ uh, relativity uh, ontology, reflecting our focus on uh, co-construction knowledge, uh, diverse uh, perspectives, and uh, subjective experiences in uh, tactical urbanism during pandemic, acknowledging context uh, dependent and uh, subjective rea uh, reality. This philosophy, this philosophy enhance our exploration by, uh, by capturing shared social experiences and understanding uh, multifaceted nat uh, nature of uh, tactical urbanism in crisis situation. Um, ethical considerations uh, are integral um, in our research, especially regarding human subjects uh, impacted by tactical urbanism initiatives during the pandemic, upholding uh, ethical uh, principles, including obtaining informed uh, contest, consent, uh, ensuring uh, confidentiality, uh, and prioritizing uh, participants' uh, well-being uh, underscore our commitment uh, to con uh, conduct responsibly um, and also respectful uh, research. Let's uh, delve into um, the fundamental uh, principle uh, that uh, define tactical urbanism, uh, guiding its dynamic approach to reshaping uh, urban spaces. Um, tactical urbanism prioritizes uh, the swift and uh, efficient uh, implementation of uh, changes in urban spaces. Uh, this means um, responding prom uh, promptly uh, to challenges or uh, opportunities, allowing for immediate transformations. Uh, the focus um, here is on um, agility, um, ensuring that interventions can be in, uh, deployed rapidly to address uh, pressing issues within the built environment. Uh, the principle of low-cost strategies uh, emphasize of affordability and feasibility of uh, tactical urbanism inter interventions. This recognizes uh, the importance of uh, decision making uh, and change, uh, making change um, that are economically access uh, accessible and uh, realistic uh, within existing re resource um, constraints. Um, by being co-effective, tactical urbanism opens up opportunity for diverse communities to actively participate in reshaping their environment without significant fi uh, financial barriers. Uh, community engagement is a core of tactical urbanism, highlighting the active involvement and collaboration of local residents in the planning and implementation of urban interventions. Uh, this principle uh, emphasizes um, the communities are not passive uh, participants, uh, um, but active contributions to decision making. Uh, the goal uh, is to foster inclusive and participatory approaches, ensuring that changes reflect the unique needs, per preference, and insight uh, of the people who inhabit and uh, that uh, the affected uh, areas. In a sense, uh, this principle um, encapsulates the cover value of tactical urbanism, emphasizing the importance of agility, uh, accessibility, and community-driven collaboration in achieving positive transformation uh, within uh, urban spaces. Uh, as we embark uh, on our case study exploration, let's uh, start by delving into the vibrant world of uh, tactical urbanism during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this case study takes us into the dynamic realm of transformative uh, urban interventions, showcasing the adaptability uh, and uh, resilience of tactical urbanism in reshaping spaces um, aimed at uh, unprecedented um, challenges. 
Uh, this case study uh, immerses uh, us in the dynamic transformation of urban spaces through the, the creation of pop-up parks during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Drawing uh, from our research, this exploration delves into the lively metamorphosis of the underutilized area into vibrant uh, temporary parks. By spotlighting the voices of community members, organizers, and uh, participants, uh, we unveil the challenges faced, uh, ingenious uh, strategy employed, and uh, the positive outcomes uh, achieved. Um, the pop-up the pop park scenario becomes a compelling uh, showcases of uh, tactical urbanism, illustrating its adaptability and capacity for swift community-driven interventions. In another case study, we examined the implementation of pedestrian-friendly installation in response to reduced road traffic, creation safer urban spaces. Um, this intervention revealed tactical urbanism strategies transforming underutilized area into pedestrian-friendly zone by, by exploring their impact on uh, community dynamics, urban landscape ch uh, challenges space, and innovating solutions. The study underscored tactical urbanism adaptability in addressing pandemic-induced challenges for positive outcome in uh, accessibility uh, in urban accessibility and safety. This theme uh, on highlighted the adaptability of tactical urbanism, showcasing its positive outcomes in reshaping urban spaces during COVID-19 era. So real-world examples, our research illustrates its pivotal role in addressing challenges and fostering lasting positive changes, uh, impacting community engagement, urban, urban uh, statistics, and also urban resilience. In exploring of challenges as solutions within the realm of tactical urbanism during the COVID-19 pandemic, our transformative journey reveals significant hurdles. In this section uh, of navigating health and safety concerns, we, confr uh, we confronted the unique challenges inherent in health crisis dealing with uh, adaptable fear of contagion uh, and also imperative uh, to prioritize public health. Our creative um, solution include the strategic pla uh, placement uh, of installation, community driving health initiative, and also uh, estrogen safety measures uh, providing to the effective uh, responses. The lesson learned uh, highlighted the adaptability and responsive, uh, resp uh, responsiveness uh, of tactical urbanism in addressing critical health consideration during uh, public health. Transitional to uh, this section of uh, our uh, coming regulatory hub, um, we encourage persistent obstacles in a uh, form of regulatory challenges. Collaborating approaches involve uh, cooperative effect efforts uh, between local governments and commun community organizers resulted in successful inter uh, strategies and uh, uh, dismantled uh, bureaucratic barrier. Lessons uh, learned from uh, navigating these regulatory challenges uh, offered valuable insight into effective uh, strategy for addressing uh, Bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic uh, complexities and the um, importance of flexibility and adaptability uh, into overcoming regulatory obstacles uh, become evidence, providing practical uh, guidance for future tactical uh, urbanism initiatives uh, in navigating legal and also um, uh, administrative uh, landscapes. Uh, in conclusion, this exploration highlighted community resilience and tactical urbanism adaptability in uh, reshaping urban landscape during COVID. Uh, creative solution and uh, collaborating uh, overcome hurdles, emphasizing flexibility in navigating regulation and uh, also health crisis. Tactical urbanism emerged uh, a dynamic force uh, reshaping uh, spacing and fostering collaborative, innovating and resilience uh, that um, this insight contribute uh, to understanding its transformative potential in navigating urban crisis. 
Uh, in this section, we focus on community engagement, a key theme uh, in um, our article on, on tactical urbanism. Uh, the first point, inclusive uh, decision making, underscored the importance of diverse perspect uh, perspectives in the success uh, of tactical urbanism initiatives, considering a wide range of voices and community needs. Moving to the second point, visual community workshop, highlights a contemporary approach using digital platform for workshop, uh, ensuring participation uh, in the um, absence of physical uh, gathering. Our article demonstrates how visual workshops effectively engage um, communities in uh, planning uh, and executing a tactical urbanism project. Um, in the third point, technology's rules emphasizing the pivotal uh, role of technology uh, in enhancing community involve involvement. Our research ex explore uh, specific digital tools uh, that facilitate communication and collaboration, providing insight into how technology enrich community participants in tactical urbanism. Uh, in summary, this slide showcased diverse community engagement, emphasizing inclusivity, um, visual platform, and technology's role, uh, derived directly from uh, our article's insights. Uh, in this segment, we delve uh, into the uh, tangible benefit and in, uh, enduring impact uh, arising from the implementation of tactical urbanism as outlined in our article. The first point, short-term benefit, revitalization and engagement underscore that tactical urbanism initiatives deliver immediate positive outcome. Our article explores how these short-term benefits contribute to the um, revitalization of urban uh, spaces and enhance community engagement, case study and example may be employed to illustrate um, the instant impact of tactical urbanism project on local communities. Uh, transitioning um, of, um, uh, to the second point, long-term impact, uh, uh, resilience urban uh, development. Uh, our focus um, in our, uh, in, on the um, lasting influence of tactical urbanism. This are, uh, the article delves into how changes initi uh, initiated through tactical urbanism extended beyond the immediate fostering uh, a more resilient and sustainable urban dev development over the long term. This discussion uh, might um, involve highlighting how short-term in interventions serve um, as a groundwork uh, for endure, uh, enduring positive changes in the urban landscape. The third point, uh, symbolic um, relationship between short-term success and long-term changes, likely elaborated, elaborates um, on the uh, interconnectedness uh, connect, con uh, of short-term uh, success uh, and long-term transformation. The article considered how the positive outcome um, achieved um, in the short term act uh, as a catalyst uh, for sustained positive urban development, creating a symbolic relationship between um, immediate success and in, um, enduring uh, changes. In a sense, this slide aimed uh, to convey the dual nature of benefits arising from tactical urbanism, immediate revitalization and engagement, a short term gain, and the establishment of um, a resilience urban development uh, uh, trajectory uh, for the long term. Um, the interconnectedness uh, interconnect, uh, connect, uh, of these elements reflects the holistic impact of tactical urbanism, uh, urbanism as discussed in our article. In conclusion, our exploration of tactical urbanism and COVID-19 has revealed uh, its transformative strategy, evolving from grassroots origins to uh, multifaceted approaches. Core uh, values include quick implementation, low-cost strategy, and community engagement. Case study highlighted um, adaptability, uh, while key theme uh, like um, community engagement and technology play pivotal, uh, vital, and also vital role in inclusive decision making. Tactical urbanism act uh, as um, a catalyst for short-term uh, revitalization and long-term urban resilience, uh, showcasing its holistic impact of uh, urban landscape. In a sense, tactical urbanism is, um, is not merely a response to challenges. Uh, it's a significant, uh, uh, significant a community-led journey of transformation, a resilience strategy that uh, shaped 
uh, urban spaces, uh, fostering inclusivity uh, and contribute to a sustainable and vibrant post-pandemic future. Our research uh, provides um, practical insights for policymakers, planners, uh, and organizers, uh, reaffirming uh, the dynamic post-pandemic um, position uh, positioning the, of tactical urbanism in the realm of uh, urban planning. Future uh, researchers uh, recommend uh, escal scalability, social economic impact, and integration of tactical urbanism for sustainable urban development. And also um, explore uh, further insight of tactical urbanism by checking out uh, our uh, comprehensive uh, list of references, uh, whether you're uh, a research policymaker or urban enthusiast. Um, this uh, source provides valuable information to enhance your understanding. Dive into the references for a deeper exploration of uh, multifaceted aspects of tactical urbanism and, in, uh, and also its uh, potential impact of sustainable urban development. At the end, uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Sahra, for your presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, any question? Do we have any question? Great, so we can proceed to the uh, next presentation, I guess. Okay. So, the um, next... Navid. Uh, yes, uh, uh, First, uh, I should have a thanks, uh, Zahra Kalantari, for uh, interesting uh, presentation and subject. Um, I have to tell you, uh, the Fardin paper uh, has not ready for present, unfortunately, and uh, we have the another present. You, you, you be the next. I don't think so. The next one that we have here is a paper by. Uh, Dr. Mohsen Kalantari about the uh, city of Urumiya in Iran, about the uh, yes. urban good governance. Okay. Yes, yes, thanks. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fifth international conference on Canadian, Chinese, and African sustainable urbanization. Let me introduce myself. I'm Mohsen Kalantari, Associate Professor in Human Geography at Shahid Bejdi University, Tehran, Iran. As you can see on the screen, the topic of our presentation is Scenario Planning for Forest Site of Good Urban Governance, a study of Urumiya City in Iran. The structure of this presentation is as follows. First, I'd like to start by talking about the introduction, theoretical foundations, and literature review. Next, I'll focus on methods and materials and explaining about Urumiya city as our study area. In the last part, I'd like to discuss the findings and conclusion of this study. As you know, the growth of cities presents challenges on the path to sustainable development. This growth has sparked significant economic, climate and environmental concerns and inequality. We now understand the importance of monitoring and planning for urban growth. Traditional management methods are insufficient and we need principled and innovative approaches such as future studies, unequal resource distribution and underdevelopment in Iran make urban planning difficult. Addressing these challenges is critical for proper urban governance. We can only realize this vision by combining research, tools, methods and strategic planning in an integrated way. 
One critical factor in the dynamic urban environment is the adaptability to change and readiness for the future. The concentration of management resources has posed challenges in urban governance in Iran and Urmia. The aim of this study is to find research approaches that encourage collaboration between the government and the private sector in Urmia. So, the primary goal of this research is to find out what factors contribute to good governance in Urmia city. The next part of this research is the review of the theoretical foundations of this topic. We have studied the basics of good urban governance and the future study based on the scenario planning model. This section has examined studies on urban governance in cities worldwide and in Iran. The distinctive aspect of the present research lies in its effort to identify key drivers and offer scenarios for good governance in Urumia city. The research aims to improve management process in Urumia city by introducing a new model that aligns with the needs of the people and the urban system. Its aim is to enhance the adaptability of urban spatial development plans for sustainable development. As mentioned earlier, we conducted this study in the Urmia city. Urmia city in West Azerbaijan province is one of the major cities in Iran and it is the political administrative center. You can see the geographical location of Urmia city in Iran and West Azerbaijan province. The steps of this research are as follows. 1. Selection of participants. 2. Data collection. 3. The Delphi method. 4. Scenario development. 5. Cross effects analysis. 6. Scenario creation. The correlation of variables was determined on a scale ranging from 3 to minus 3 using the pairwise comparison method. We use Scenario Wizard software in the study to analyze key factors and propose implementation scenarios. You can see influential indicators in good governance in Urmia city in this table. These findings show how different factors in good governance in Urmia city. It took two steps to do this. First step, check the variables. The research identified eight key components with associated indicators in the subject area. One, effectiveness with five indicators. Two, decentralization with five indicators. Three, equality and inequality with five indicators. Four, participation and citizen orientation with five indicators. Five, consensual orientation with three indicators. Six, transparency with five indicators. Seven, rule of law with two indicators. Eight, responsibility with seven indicators. Second step, examining the relationship between variables. Experts conducted this diagnosis in total. With n variables, there were n questions, amounting to approximately 1,308 questions for the 37 variables in this research. You can see the preliminary analysis of matrix data and cross effects on the screen. After two rotations of data, the desirability of direct effects was found to be 100% showing a high level of validity and optimization of the questionnaire and its associated responses. You can see the degree of usefulness of the direct effects matrix as shown. As previously mentioned, we selected 37 indicators to represent good urban governance in Urmia city. We extracted key indicators influencing good management in Urmia city using Micmac software. 
The variables in the system must fall within the range that includes goals and risks. Dispersion of influence and direct influence of variables is shown in this figure. This analysis helps identify the factors that play a crucial role in good governance and how they interact with one another in Urumia city. You can see the effectiveness of the influential variables in the good governance of Urumia city in this table. The level of influence of the key factors of good governance in Urumia city is shown in this table. In the third step, we identified vital variables using direct and indirect classification methods. Out of the 37 indicators examined, we identified the pivotal factors that impact the quality of governance in Urumia city. These key factors play a crucial role in determining the success or failure of critical decisions. We used Micmac software to analyze the structure and identified eight key factors that influenced Urmia City's governance. List of key factors of good governance in Urmia City is shown in this table. After the essential vital factors influencing the governance of Urmia City were identified, the uncertainties raised for each of the variables of urban governance were designed and formulated using experts' opinions. Then, using the views of experts, weights were given to each of the assumptions based on the two parameters of importance in qualitative, favorable, aesthetic and critical and quantitative number 3 to minus 3. Key factors and related possible situations are shown in this table. Examining scenarios has identified a wide range of potential features to govern the Urmia city. Three of the 36,864 possible scenarios stand out as particularly strong in compatibility. In this table summarizes these scenarios along with their respective conditions, desirability and criticality. The different scenarios in Urumia city show contrasting potential features for governance. In the optimistic scenarios, key factors like administrative system efficiency, rule of law, financial transparency, citizens' rights and more are in optimal states. The city governance will be negatively affected if these key factors deteriorate. You can see scenarios with a strong compatibility for good governance in Urumia city in this table. The system network of good governance scenarios of Urumia city is shown in this figure. In this table, the most effective assumptions and their consistency are shown. This study identifies 12 potential scenarios for future governance developments in Urumia city. Out of these, the highest count is attributed to scenarios with a static situation, 8 scenarios, indicating a prevalent trend of maintaining the existing state. Nonetheless, there are also scenarios with a critical condition, three scenarios, and one scenario with a favorable situation. These diverse scenarios underscore the complexity and variability inherent in governance dynamics. The study indicates that effective decision making in Urumia city requires the use of good urban governance principles. To create a people-centric city, planning must shift from being for the city to with the city. This research indicates that Urumia city must improve its participatory planning and local governance. Thank you so much for your attention.
Thank you so much. Uh, I wish the best for Dr. Kalantari. Uh, unfortunately, he's not with us currently. And uh, the floor is yours, Professor Fanny. No, I I don't have any notes or question or <laughs> explanation. You can continue. Okay, so yeah, that's the uh, that's the one thing that was kind of common between all the presentation was the talking about the governance and the state. Uh, this is a real major factor in uh, urban planning in Iran. If we approach in uh, in many ways or different ways uh, to a uh, urban problem or urban question. We kind of need to touch the the governance and uh, the rule of the state. Yeah, this is a really tricky part about the urban planning in Iran. And I think the next presentation uh, would be uh, my presentation. So let me just uh, share my screen. So, uh, I need to see my screen. Uh, so my presentation is about the um, uh, participation and the tale of urban planning in Iran. This is the first time that we are uh, talking about the Iran and urban planning uh, in Iran in Ikasu, and. Uh, I think we need to have a, a little bit explanation about its history and the process that shape uh, today's Iranian cities. Uh, it is really important for everyone <laughs> right now and future to see this uh, information in this uh, video right here. So for a, as an introduction, uh, my study about the uh, participation, public participation in Iran, uh, firstly was focusing on the context of the urban planning in Iran, uh, which shapes societies and uh, assume a distinctive character in Iran. So uh, this region's urban development journey encapsulated a rich uh, tapestry of historical, cultural, and social political dynamics. The Iranian experience offers an insightful study into how urban planning is influenced by varying power structures from centralized government dictates to emerging participatory approaches. It serves a unique case to explore the interplay between traditional methods and modern uh, participatory practices in urban planning. One thing which is worth to mention, the title is from the Kingdom Lash to Participation. There is a tale about the King Reza, King Reza Pahlavi, which was building the, the one of the very famous streets in Tehran, which is called Valias. It's around, I think, 14 kilometers. And at the beginning to the end, there is a unique kind of trees. And uh, the tale is about that the, the king himself ordered the workers to start uh, growing trees uh, besides the uh, the the uh, street and the uh, uh, sidewalks uh, from the starting point to the end, to the end point of the that street and uh, based on the gaps between trees. So uh, they had to put trees together. And if there is a gap based on the number of the gaps, they will be whipped with the kingdom lash. And yeah, they had to the, kind of put two or three trees together. So eventually one of those three grows and they don't get whipped. Yeah, it's like that. It's just a tale in one of the historical books. Yeah. So we, we are not sure if it's true or not, but uh, the whole 
atmosphere of the urban planning at that point was kind of the top to the bottom like that, very strict and very uh, uh, actually, how can I say, it's like uh, oppressed, something like that. So uh, this presentation aims to examine the historical evolution of urban planning in Iran from that traditional centralized mod method that I told you to uh, a modern participatory practices and discuss the rule of power dynamics in shaping urban planning approaches with an emphasis on the transition from uh, faculty and power models to communicative planning theories and eventually investigate the implication of these shifts in urban planning for Iranian cities, focusing on participation, decision-making, and the impact of the global and national events. So for the theoretical framework, the key theories for my study was, first of all, the focus power knowledge theory. And after that, it was Habermas communicative rationality and Weber instrumental rationality as the third one and uh, for the overlapping areas it influ those actually influence on policy formulation impact on urban governance and they have a role in shaping public spaces each one of them but for the sake of the time i cannot explain more uh at this point and uh, but those frameworks they have they had to be relevant to Iran's urban planning. And in Iran, urban planning initially reflected a top-down approach resonating with the focus concept of centralized power, where decisions were primarily made by those in authority without much public participation. And then it shifts to, it shifts towards communicative rationality. Modern Iranian urban planning is gradually shifting toward participatory and communicative approaches. This change aligns with Habermas's idea uh, where planning processes are increasingly inclusive, incorporating diverse community voices and striving for consensus. And at the end, the instrumental rationality in planning, traditional plan urban planning in Iran also exhibit aspects of the Weber's instrumental rationality, where planning was uh, primarily focused on efficiency and effectiveness, often at the cost of disregarding public opinion and ethical considerations. So the first episode or the, the kingdom lash, which uh, backs to the, the first uh, part of the Pahlavi dynasty, the King Reza. And uh, is that the Shah? Usually Shah means the, the his son, King Muhammad Reza. Uh, but in 96, uh, 1906, the constitutional revolution marked a pivotal moment in Iranian history, aligning with the global movements toward more modernization, and reformation. Also, the establishment of national parliament and constitutional law, this period saw significant political and social transformation laying, laying the groundwork for systematic changes in urban planning. And uh, as I told you, formation of the Pahlavi dynasty, a shift toward modernism began significantly altering the urban landscape of Iran, particularly in cities like Tehran, Isfahan, Yazd, and Kerman. In this episode, the main features of urban planning was kind of the shift from the tradition to modernism, inspired by European urban reforms, and particularly Tosman's renovation in Paris. And uh, but there was uh, a lack of a master plan. Urban changes were implemented without a comprehensive master plan. And instead, basic street maps were used to guide the development, emphasizing the importance of streets over the urban elements. And the changes, often abrupt and forceful, affected the physical and social fabric of cities 
disrupting traditional structures and community bonds. At some points, they divided uh, a unique neighborhood, which was, uh, you know, uh, by itself had so much culture and so much, uh, you know, memories. And they divided by, uh, they divided that neighborhood with the streets, with, you know, straight streets. And uh, King Reza emphasized modern modernizing streets and planting trees, as I mentioned, aiming to mimic European city uh, aesthetics. Uh, this approach often overlooked the need and cultural aspects of the local residents. And the urban planning was uh, dominated by the state with little to non-participation from local communities reflecting a traditional power structure. But as we go uh, by time in the second episode, which I called it Three Brothers, refers to the guidance plan, master plan, and detail plan. They kind of, uh, well, they was, the, those plans and introducing those plans was uh, one of the focal point of uh, urban planning or history of urban planning in Iran. So the Shah or the King Mohammad Reza marked significant acceleration in urban planning changes. And it was kind of based the oil money at that time. But that's another uh, subject and different perspective. However, this period was saw a move from responding to immediate urban problems to planning for long-term urban developments. As I mentioned in this area, the master plan, which can be uh, active for maybe, uh, I think it was, it was been between eight and 10 years or even more than that uh, at some cities. In some cities, the master plan uh, lasts long for 25 years even. And uh, the era introduced more organized urban planning approaches, moving away from ad hoc decisions. And as you can see here, the urban guidance plan introduced to direct the future expansion of cities and land use, addressing immediate urban challenges and proposing short-term solutions. And after that, we had uh, the urban master plan and detailed plan. So the master plan kind of give uh, the whole urban development at the schema and the detailed plans goes on each zone of those urban master plan and try to explain based on land parcels and any kind of activity that is allowed or not allowed on that zone of that bigger master plan. So these plans were formulated to improve this spatial structure and social comfort, focusing on long-term city planning and zoning for various urban functions. However, despite this advancement, the planning process were still top-down with little to no participation from the public. The government remained the primary decision-making decision maker reflecting continued centralized centralized power the planning approaches were influenced by western models but lacked their participatory aspect the this period saw the adaptation of models like synoptic planning but with minimal public participation the third episode uh, is after the uh, Iran revolution, uh, there is a, a war between Iran and Iraq, and uh, there is a lot of changes in different level of administration and office running, and uh, those changes, and also uh, the, the relationship between Iran and Western co uh, countries based on the accident of the USA embassy was kind of gloomy and on it, all the uh, international investors was kind of uh, concerned about what's going on on Iran. In this situation, 
Iran faces uh, two distinguished crises. One of them is economic and the other one is demographic. The, and that um, crisis continue until the late 1990s. And uh, those crises increased poverty and inefficient management. And there was a need, uh, a pressing requirement for strategies that could address these challenges uh, holistically and sustainably. sustainably. So in this period, uh, there are there are two or three different kind of plans introduced to be the substitute for that master plan detail plan. Uh, one of them was the CDS City Development Strategy, and uh, it was sponsored by international organizations like World Bank and UN Habitat. The CDS approach was adopted in 2005 and started in the city of Khazvin. And that CDS aimed at strategic planning with a participatory perspective, addressing key areas like shelter, poverty, uh, eradication, and economic development. But although the CDS uh, marked a shift toward involving communities, uh, particularly in the empowerment of women and citizen training, uh, its real impact on public participation was limited and often symbolic. So they had to have some public participation because it was funded by UN Habitat and World World Bank and some of those international organizations, and they needed the proof of that public participation. But the government itself just was interested only on money, not public participation and these plans. So despite the introduction of the CDS, uh, challenges like high unemployment rate and economic uh, stagnation persisted, uh, indicating a gap between planning objectives and actual out outcomes. This raised questions about the efficiency, efficacy of uh, such a a strategies in truly transforming urban conditions and empowering citizens. But uh, as I mentioned before, there, in that period, on that first episode, uh, the criticism of the master plan uh, raised significant, significantly. And uh, these are kind of, uh, uh, those, some of those critics about the master plan that was uh, being raised in Iran. So one of them was functional zoning inefficiency the urban master plans were criticized for their ineffective functional zoning, leading to issues like traffic conge congestion and unmanaged urban sprawl. And also uh, they highlighted the plans focus on physical aspects, neglecting the social, cultural, and economic dimensions of urban development. And also uh, those master plans uh, was too rigid and lacking the necessary flexibi flexi flexibility to adapt the, to, to changing urban needs, uh, the inability of urban management to effectively implement these master plans was a significant issue. And also one of the key criticism was the absence of the citizen part, uh, participation in both the planning and also the execution phase. And uh, in that period, the new directions came up and that was a shift to strategic structural plans in response to these critics uh, that new approach was proposed aimed at addressing the deficiencies of the master plans to enhance public participations neighborhood concerts were established intended to represent citizen interest in urban planning process 
these changes raised important questions about the accountability of urban administration to local communities and the real extent of power redistribution through public participation. Despite these changes, the strategic structural plan for Tehran, for example, failed to achieve its primary objectives, such as controlling urban growth and population distribution, raising doubts about the effectiveness of these new approaches. And uh, one of the, the key factors for that failure was uh, uh, it, it, in theory or on the paper, the the plan, the strategic structural plan for Tehran was really, uh, you know, the was really accurate and it was kind of uh, promising, but uh, behind the closed doors, the, there were some people that decision to suddenly at night or midnight changed some part of it after it was fixed actually and made everything in the reality very different than what was planned to be on that uh, you know uh, the strategic structural plan draft and but there at the same time there was some cases like the dawn of participation for the first time, it was uh, the Bandarabas City informal settlement upgrading project, uh, which marked a significant shift in incorporating citizen participation in the planning process. And it was started at uh, 2001, represented a pioneering effort in participatory urban planning in Iran. That project, Bandarabas City informal settlement, upgrading project or uh, Basi So brought together uh, various stakeholders, including governmental and non-governmental organizations in the, planning in the planning process, emphasizing a collaborative approach to urban development. The project emphasized several key principles, creating safe residential zones involving citizens in all stages, providing access to financial resources for low-income groups, support local community-based organizations, and focusing on social group empowerment. Role of urban planners uh, in this project uh, was the role of a mediator, balancing the needs and inputs of the, the community with planning expertise. This approach represented a significant departure from traditional top-down planning methods. And also uh, the project aimed at empowering local communities, especially marginalized groups, to have a say in the development plan of their city. It demonstrated the public participation can lead to more inclusive and effective urban planning. But one problem, the one problem was that was uh, it was it was in very small scale. So there is a difference between a city like Bandarabos that it that plan was kind of uh, focused on one part of the Bandarabos, not the whole city. Uh, there is a difference between that kind of project with the city like Tehran. It's around. Uh, 750 uh, square kilometer uh, and also it has around 16 million people in day and maybe 8 to 10 million people in at night so that that city is really different and that that was the problem that that uh, basiso project uh, couldn't be uh, you know spread around the country and uh, others can, uh, in other cities can be employed. However, this year, this table here, shows the, uh, the, the finding of my study, historical study, about the urban planning in Iran. So we can see that between 1930 to 1960, the first episode, we only had the street map, which was kind of a blueprint planning, it was 
completely centralized in case of power. The rationality was instrumental. And also the urban planner was kind of a drafter. And as you can see, it will be it will kind of change to uh, different uh, level of participation. For example, in ep episode three, when we introduced the uh, the CDS, uh, we kind of uh, redistributed power. We had the semi centralized power. And uh, the urban planner role, uh, the, the, the role of urban planner was kind of between drafter, legislator, and advisor. And at the end, the episode five uh, from the 2007, uh, we had some, as I said again, the small scale projects that uh, the power is uh, plural and the rationality is based on the communicational and it can have the potential to be a real participation and urban planner is not the drafter anymore it's like a facilitator facilitator or mediator it's like that and uh, so i presented some key takeaways for example limited public participation historically traditional urban planning in iran has been uh, characterized characterized by a lack of substantial public involvement and there are a lot of reasons for that i had other articles that kind of uh, work on this for example the oil money is really important uh, the government that is not doesn't depend on, you know, uh, citizen taxes, can do whatever he wants. And emerging trends in participatory planning, recent approaches like in Pandarabas show promises in shifting towards more inclusive planning and also challenges in implementation despite the theoretical shift, practical application of participatory planning phases. Uh, many challenges, especially in larger cities like Tehran. As I mentioned, Tehran is a very different case from other cities in Iran, from the, the political view, from cultural view, from social view, all these together. And uh, for future implications, need for a genuine, genuine uh, participatory approaches, balancing expertise and citizen input, and potential for democratic and inclusive urban development. And thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you, Navid, uh, your subject and your research is very interesting for me. And, uh, but uh, I have a um, comment uh, about uh, uh, some facts and challenges uh, that you mentioned properly in your uh, in your uh, presentation. Uh, that's uh, uh, like uh, public involvement, public participation, uh, lack of those uh, facts or something. Uh, those are uh, uh, caused uh, or or uh, uh, extracted uh, from uh, political economy and uh, uh, approach um, of uh, uh, is uh, common in the in the country, not not a uh, special for. Uh, one uh, province or two province uh, totally Iran uh, has influenced uh, by uh, decisions uh, that uh, affected on uh, public uh, participation and uh, uh, many facts you mentioned in your paper do you know 
so I don't fully grasp the the the, the question, but the, the the comment you mentioned that it is not only for Tehran or Ghazvin or uh, is kind of a. Uh, it's something that is runs through the whole country's veins. That's that's the totally accurate. And the problem is that the usually uh, that, that the government, based on my PhD <laughs> dissertation, kind of think itself as the guardian of incapable or incapable uh, children. That those those children are the whole Iranian citizen, and as a guardian, he decides. Uh, it decides uh, to focus on what he decides is the best for the citizen, not they want, not the 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 thing that the citizen themselves wants that and want that. And the thing is that in this situation like that, being a guardian, being above the people, they usually create, uh, the extraordinary situation and based on the uh, the extraordinary situation uh, you can do whatever you want and you can kind of go around the law or rules like that for example at some point they they used to do that at the, some point when i mentioned about the war between iran and iraq after the urban revolution iran revolution and uh, ending the Pahlavi dynasty, they said that we are in extraordinary situation. We are at war. And by saying that, uh, you make you make yourself eligible to be above the law, you know? And at the same, uh, at some point, they, when the, they want to, do their job not their job they want to do uh, their actions and those actions is kind of uh, against the law they created extraordinary situation they say okay we are facing uh, for example US sanctions we are in war with the USA we are in war with Saudi Arabia and in in the shadow of those extraordinary situations, the law uh, kind of lose its, you know, uh, uh, it loses its own uh, uh, effectiveness. Yeah, it's like that. And also we have exactly, Ali. Exactly, thank you. Uh, is there any question? I think Alan, yes, Alan. Yes, Alan. Yes, thanks again, uh, Navid. That was a really fascinating um, uh, presentation. Yeah, congratulations. That was um, very well produced. Um, I have a comment, uh, though, about um, the concept and the um, uh, of participatory planning of of um, and I I think it's interesting that. Um, um the the inclusion or the um of participatory planning in the contemporary urban agenda um appears to have come out of the pressure from uh, institutions like UN Habitat um the new urban agenda that was adopted in um in uh, Quito Ecuador in 2016 etc that became part of the um the whole discourse about planning. Um, the the um, that approach to participatory planning is rooted. Um, the um, it really. Helen, I lost your voice. I guess. Alan, uh, unfortunately, I can't hear you. So which is kind of in parallel to the historical trajectory that um, that uh, Navid, you presented in your presentation. But um, it's really rooted in, um, at least in official 
discourse around the campaigns led by Jane Jacobs in the 1960s in places like Toronto and um, and uh, uh, Jane Jacobs was uh, um, had fled the US as a <laughs> as a, a refugee during the Vietnam War because of, uh, I think to protect her son from from uh, being drafted into um, I, I'm not sure of that that story but uh, she had been an activist in in New York fighting against uh, heavy handing heavy handed um, uh, planning of uh, famous, uh, urban planner Robert Moses in New York, who was a traffic planner, basically, um, and um, smashed through um, um, uh, poor communities that were really active and vital. And um, Jane Jacobs, um, when I was a student in uh, Canada, um, 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 was uh, a leader of a campaign against the um, uh, what was called the Spadina Expressway in Toronto. And um, uh, we were all very much engaged at that time and um, around uh, some of the early processes of participatory planning. And that became, um, that whole movement um, led to the creation of UN Habitat and the, the first UN Habitat conference and the um, Civil Society Forum in Vancouver in 1976. And um, so um, there has always been um, a campaign from civil society around promoting um, um, participatory planning and consultation, um, uh, human rights, civic rights, really. Um, it's largely around civic rights um, that uh, has actually influenced, okay, it took decades, but has um, been now incorporated into the uh, um, the international agenda. You know, it's now really part of the planning vocabulary now. So um, it's um, it's interesting. The um, that movement uh, uh, has roots in not only Toronto but also uh, Tondo in in Manila in the Philippines, where there were um, it was a large um, slum removal programs and um, and other uh, other um, uh, cities of the global south that contributed to that movement so um, it's uh, it's just interesting um, uh, the evolution of planning thought in in Iran as well thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Unfortunately, at some point, I lost uh, your voice, honestly. Uh, but yes, you are totally right. And also, it was to mention that the Jane Jacobs uh, ideas, actually, that herself, the ideas of the Jane Jacobs is really important in the, at least in urban, plan, uh, urban planning uh teaching this course and pedagogy in Iran, uh, all the universities uh, from the bachelor degree until to the PhD level, they will at some point talk about the Jane Jacobs ideas. And in, in theory, public participation is uh, <clears throat> really valuable in Iranian's document. It's really praised. But the uh, but the problem is that it was it uh, it is in in the document when you are uh, there is a guideline uh, for how to uh, conduct a strategic and structural plan. It's like the the the, the you know the it's like the master plan but with some differences. Uh, there is a guideline for that, and on that guideline it says that if you want to. Uh, do a strategic structure plan for a city. It is advised to have public participation. They changed it at the last minute. So it is advised. It's not a mandatory. So if you didn't do it, uh, that's okay. If you did it, uh, good for you. It's like that, you know. They changed that at the last minute. And also, as I mentioned, uh, not even at the law, uh, 
uh, uh, section, which is it is advice and not uh, mandatory. It is above that the central government. First of all, the land is really important and really valuable for uh, the government itself because the, the Iran is not like you know Canada. It's not vast. You saw Iran before you visited Iran, and uh, before the, the whole geopolitical and economical aspect of the land, uh, the government don't want to hear the citizen or any people or any Iranian voices. And to, to, do, the, to do that and also being above the law, it creates extraordinary situation, you know, as I mentioned. Uh, that extraordinary situation means you can do anything you want and you are not responsible for that because we are in the war, we are in the extraordinary situation. And uh, yeah, it's like that. Oh, I saw Zahra. Zahra. Zahra, Tracy. Uh -huh. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to express my sincere thanks for your uh, insightful presentation and uh, handling all the arrangements for the conference. I truly appreciate it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alan, uh, was my uh, answer any helpful? Because I lost your voice for some part. Of, I didn't hear part of your... Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I just... Um, wanted to comment that I think no government wants to encourage yeah. citizens yeah. participation. It's a struggle that uh, civil society and, and um, citizens must um, uh, continue to work, you know, towards uh, defending their civic rights. Um, you know, the, the struggle to um, get the, the right to the city um, included in the new urban agenda that was adopted in 2016. It, it required uh, civil society all over the world, you know, really to um, engage in advocacy and lobbying uh, with their um, with their governments and uh, etc. to to get these um, what are now you're correct. Um, they're uh, they're soft international law in that they're um, it's it's not exactly uh, considered a full human right, but it's um, <laughs> it's advice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's the first step. Uh, I think most uh, human rights start out as um, recommendations rather yeah. than yeah. Um, uh, obligations, but. Um, um, I think as civil society um, internationally continues to struggle for having the issues like the right to the city um, uh, as part of um, um, proper internet, you know, recognize um, uh, uh, human rights. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, that's a nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Thank you. And uh, the final word with Professor Fanning. Uh, I just uh, tell Navid since I appreciate and uh, for for handling for manage uh, and the logistic uh, the, the uh, this meeting and uh, I uh, have to um, thank uh, the other participants, especially uh, Professor Allen and uh, uh, other participants. Uh, uh, totally, this meeting uh, is the first uh, our experience uh, in uh, Ottawa University and uh, this conference, especially. And uh, I hope uh, uh, we uh, plan for future uh, uh, section of this conference. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining us today. Uh, I think we have a award ceremony of ICASO.
coming up and also you can uh, visit other panels. Uh, I think we have a live panels and through the webinar links from the Nairobi because the whole Ecoso is uh, holding on in Nairobi. Anyway, thank you so much, everyone. Let me know if you need to access those links. I can provide it to you. And uh, enjoy your uh, rest of the day. Actually, rest of the night in Tehran and also here in Canada. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.